Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. My guest today is Matt Zachary. And Matt Zachary is, for lack of a better word, he is a podcaster, a speaker, calls himself, or he's been called a cancer tainer. He is an influencer of things, and he is a survivor with an amazing story that he shares with us. This is not a normal episode for this podcast. If you want to hear a really interesting conversation and an interesting story with an interesting human being, tune in. Uh, Matt's great. He's just an amazing human. And I think you guys are really going to like this. And don't forget to follow me on LinkedIn. Check us out on MSL Talk Live, which is the first Tuesday of every month, 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, typically. Um, and check us out on uh, all our videos go up on YouTube. So you may be watching this right now. I hope you are. Uh, but thank you for joining us. This is a great conversation. And I know you're going to love it. Welcome to MSL Talk with Tom Caravella, a podcast specifically designed for MSLs and all things field medical. Hey, Matt, welcome to the podcast, brother. Thanks for joining Hello, me. Hello, Tom. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. So guys, crazy story. I'm with my buddy, Michael Parisi. Shout out to Michael. Um, we go to ASCO together every year. He's like, you got to meet my buddy, Matt. And Matt and I sit down and I'm like, dude, would you come on the podcast? And he's like, and and just so you guys know, Matt is a very accomplished podcaster. Like he's varsity, I'm JV, just so you guys know. So Matt, welcome. Why don't you do a quick introduction before we get into like the meat of your story? Sure. Uh, and thanks again for having me on the show. Hello, listeners. <laughs> you, you got a great, great host here and you're not, I'm not varsity and you're not this. We're We're, we're all doing the right thing, which is great. <laughs> So I'm a bit of a hodgepodge, but my career has spanned across old school advertising, marketing. I'm a concert pianist and entertainer by trade. I've worked in nonprofit, public health policy, broadcast media, digital health strategy, and the word innovation is kind of a fridge magnet jargon right now. But I do this because when I was in college, I was diagnosed with brain cancer out of nowhere. And my aspirations to be a film composer got shot to shit. And now I'm here, thankfully, 27 years later, cancer free. Amazing. And and let's so if if it's cool, can we get into your story? If you could tell your stories, guys, sit back. I want you to hear this story. It is amazing. Um, and it. You know, what's the parallel to medical affairs? Um, well, we'll we'll get into that, but Matt is a is an advocate for all humans, especially um the underdog and and people that battle cancer and and people that want to overcome in their lives. It's just an amazing story. So I'll Matt, I'll let you tell it and then we'll we'll kind of take it from there. Yeah, I mean, I can give you the the shorter story because this this could be like a, a Tolstoyan tome at this point. <laughs> but the 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 short and uh you know the short and curlies are raised in New York City, began to play piano in middle school, actually fifth grade, became the big fish in the small pond, learned classical, pop, jazz, uh American classics, musical theater went to Binghamton, upstate New York, for a degree in, not what you think, five-year master's in in prosthetics and biomedical engineering. Wow. Uh, which done me in probably second semester of sophomore year with 7 a.m. Organic Chemistry 3. Uh, but I had already found a wonderful niche at Binghamton of musical theater nerds, and I, be I became like the accompanist for the entire mm -hmm. school, which is exciting as like a, a hobby. But that eventually flipped, and I wound up switching my major to music with a minor in computer science and sociology. I became a really quick Mac nerd. I was doing digital media MIDI on my crappy gray computer and my 12-inch screen. And I was writing, you know, or orchestrations and, and, and themes and, and all this cinematic, wonderful stuff. And I wanted to be John Williams as one does mm -hmm. when they're 19 yeah. <laughs> and trying to write for orchestra. 
and I eventually got into USC Film School's early admissions uh, process. Um, and everything was all set. And of course, man plans and God laughs. And during the summer of 95, before I started my senior year, uh, my left hand uh, lost some muscle coordination for no reason. So I was a pianist and I could play, but it was weird. My left hand was weird. My right hand was fine. And, you know, that's not a symptom of normal things when you're 21. So, of course, no one took me seriously and I was misdiagnosed for months and, you know, just trying to get through a muscle lefty so I couldn't write. And I was only typing with my right hand because I had a laptop at the time because I mentioned I was a Mac nerd. That story, long short, is that eventually I had seizures and fainted and dizzy spells and nausea and my eyes kind of went sideways. And, oh, there's something really wrong with Matt <laughs> after being diagnosed with everything but. So, of course, shit at the fan came home after after the semester ended, had the uh, an MRI. This was 95. What the hell's an MRI? Let's give yeah. perspective to yeah. all of this stuff. You mean I stick my head in a tube for two hours and they see my brain? That's what life was like in 1995. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, they're like, oh yeah, there's, there's something in your head. But here's a great Gen X 90 story for your listeners that are probably of our census demographic. So my mom and I went to the radiation, or, I'm sorry, the, the radiology clinic. I got the tests. Went out to lunch afterwards. We got back to the house and the answering machine was blinking. What does that mean, dad? Exactly. So, hello, this is the hospital. Get your ass back here. Mm -hmm. So, sure enough, they did another MRI, this time with contrast, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, get. I'm sure your audience knows what that is, gadolinium. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like, yeah, there's, there's something in there. You got to meet with our neurosurgeon. What? Sorry. Say that again. So this was um, this was the day after Boxing Day, so December 26, 95. Because I know that because I was at my friend's house for Boxing Day, and she's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I, I think there's something in my head. Oh, so, man. True story, true story. And uh, the 27th, we met with the doctor. No, I'm sorry, the Friday the 28th. And I know this because it was Shabbat, and he was an Orthodox Jew, like a fully practicing Orthodox Jew. And he took off Shabbat to meet with my parents and I, for three hours mm. at his office. Wow. And that's a mensch. Mm. That's empathy. And he's a great man. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to operate on you. You'll be fine. I've done 3,000 of these. It turned out to be something called the medulloblastoma, which is a very weird brain tumor for two specific reasons. One, you're born with it. It doesn't develop in your head. It's congenital. And it falls under the category of primary neuroendocrine tumor. The second is it's not in your brain. <laughs> it's in your cerebellum, which is really mm. your, not really your brain. It's a part of your brain. Yeah. So it presents symptoms very differently. It doesn't do the normal symptoms of a tumor in your head, which is why it messed with my left hand. Of all wow. the things to mess with as a pianist. Right. With. Eventually it started pressing on the brain stem and that's when the real symptoms started to happen that fall. But yeah, sure enough, between December 28th and January 10th, it was pretty tense. Uh, we don't know what this is in the sense of, will you live? There's 200 a year in the world. Mm, wow. And that happens an eight-year-old and you're 21. All this pre-internet, pre-everything, what the hell's going on? No Google world. Right. So yeah, surgery on the 10th. Just as a humorous side note, the 9th, was the storm of the century in the Northeast. 37 inches of snow fell upon New York City in a day. And the army was plowing the streets and we followed the military snow plows to the hospital on the 10th. True story. Wow. Surgery, 10 days in the hospital. We got as much as we could. Clean margins. What's a margin? Help me understand this. And uh, yeah, you know, you're, we, we're not quite sure you're done yet. We're going to convene something wow. called a tumor board. What's a tumor board? Well, we get a bunch of misogynistic white guys in a room to debate whether you're dying or not and what they want to do with you to own your protocols and your data. Okay, great. That's a tumor board. Done. Great. Nice, nice job, guys. So the tumor board convenes, and they get back to us about a week later and say, eh, we don't know what to do with you. Good luck. Seriously. Like the top eight guys in the city couldn't agree what to do with me. 
So, yeah. <laughs> so much for all that stuff. Turns out that the 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 least worst decision came from a uh, an oncologist I met through the neurosurgeon named Dr. Jeffrey Allen at NYU Hassenfeld Children's Center. And he's like, let's give you this dose of radiation. And they had a brand new thing back then called stereotactic radio surgery. I'm like, what's that? Everything was, what's that? Like, we had no idea what the hell this was. We're just like, we're Nubians into this space. Oh, it's like a laser to your brain that only kills the bad stuff. How novel, like Zaxxon, just like in the arcades, right? You, you go where the tumor's going to be and you zap it differently. So yeah, I had 6,000 CG of high-dose radiation craniospinal with this. And I could speak the language. I had a 3,300 3, CG boost to the posterior fossa through stereotactic radio surgery, like a clinical trial for it. Uh, by the way, I didn't go back to school. I had to call the school. I might be dead. I don't know what's going on. Uh, maybe I'll do some stuff from home for fun. I had my computer. I needed something to do. And that spring was terrible. And this is all, you're 21 at this point. I'm 21. Yeah. Sheesh. So, you know, everyone came out of the woodwork. I mean, it was nice. My father was very, very uh, well known growing up on Staten Island. He was the uh, assistant principal of the largest high school in the city. He also taught industrial arts, another lost art in teaching our kids to do shit that isn't mm -hmm. math. So he was well known, very well known. And when he hit the, you know, there really wasn't an internet button back then, but we did phone trees. Yeah. <laughs> and the phone tree was like, Matt's got cancer and, and the whole island like rallied around, which was very exciting, very privileging. And, uh, you know, we got yelled at for having too many flowers in the hospital and the phone didn't stop ringing because there was no call waiting back then. And it was just like busy signals. Right? Yeah. Everything's going nostalgic in this yeah. weird story. But I didn't really get to do much between uh, February 14th and March 30th were the days of the radiation. Um, driving to the city every single day to Sloan Kettering with my dad up the FDR. Those fuckers charged 50 bucks a day for parking. Fuck you, yeah. Sloan Kettering. I'm sorry. You might have saved my life, but fuck you for charging cancer patients 50 bucks a day for parking. You know, and I mean that. I just sincerely mean that. They can go fuck themselves for charging patients for, for parking. Anyway, uh, have I mentioned I'm brutally honest? <laughs> well, yeah, I, and, and I, I should have put the disclaimer, hey, guys, just buckle up because, um, yeah. you know, Matt has a tendency to let it rip. So keep letting it rip. We're fine. This is a this is a little bit of a divergence from what we normally do on this on this show. But I think it's it's uh, it's perfect timing. We, we We definitely need to have a conversation like this. But they're they're targeted expletives. <laughs> I'll just throw them out. Very there true. No Very true. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of breezing through this, <clears throat> but I had all the symptoms of high dose Chernobyl level easy bake oven radiation that you know most people don't really have today. Mm. Uh, I lost all my hair. My skin was burning. I couldn't eat, drink, sleep. Um, I was vomiting. 15 times a day, like nothing, like heaving. I had no muscle mass left. I could barely hear. Um, wow. You must they, have felt they, like they, you were dying. The expression I use is that I lost my life, but I didn't die. Mm. And I didn't get to live a normal 20s. But the next part of this story is really, really, really relevant today. And I spent a lot of time when I do my talks on this one particular thing that happened to me. So I finished radiation. I'm a shell of a human being. Um, I still couldn't really play piano well, although my once they took the tumor out, my hand worked, but it didn't work as well as it used to because didn't. it was crippled for like eight months. So can you say crippled? I mean, I think that's okay in this context. You, I don't yeah. know. It's, it's 2023. Yeah. Well, you're talking about and, yourself too. So Yeah, I'm talking about myself. I had a crippled hand. And... And we go back to the day. I'm like, when am I going to die now? Because you gave me six months, six months ago. What am I doing now? And of course, had I known then what I now know is they pulled us out of the deepest cockles of their asshole and said the following. We think you have a 50% chance to live for five years. And again, if this happened today, I'm like, oh, from where in your ass did you get that data? Because there was no data. They yeah. made it up. 
And that's top-notch bullshit. And I'm like, well, okay, that's terrible. I'm 22. I turned 22. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, but we want to give you chemotherapy. I'm like, what chemotherapy? <laughs> I know Deborah Winger died in terms of endearment 10 years ago. What's chemotherapy? I'm like, oh, yeah, um, it's just, uh, let's make sure. Let's do a spinal tap and a bone marrow, and we'll we'll make sure you're clean, but we still want to give you chemotherapy. I was like, all right, I got to get back to you. Uh, two things happened between when that conversation happened and when, when I went back to them. Number one, I did graduate. Back up to Binghamton. Kudos to the school for not giving the cancer kid, like, the the, the boot. <laughs> We'll let yeah. you graduate. It's okay. You, you can do what you want. It's good. Seriously. It's like I got to go to graduation, bald and skinny and vomiting every day, but I went up there and I graduated. And the second thing, and this begins the narrative that is relevant today more than any other part of my nostalgic story down memory lane. I happened to have a godfather, my dad's best friend, named Dr. J. Tishfield. He's very Googleable. Jay was one of the earliest pioneers out of Yale in the 60s and 70s in genomics globally. He worked at Indiana University, Bloomington, where they invented all the platinums with Sidney Farber. And he's a luminary around the world. And of course, he's taking tremendous interest in his godson that's dying. And when we said to him, they want to give me chemotherapy, he's like, well, let me talk to them. Okay. About what? Don't worry about it. <laughs> Forgot about it. So Jay pulled all of his strings and got Sloan Kettering to give him the protocols they're recommending to me. This doesn't happen in 1995. Yeah. Got very lucky. And it turns out, and again, I'm going to reinforce to your listeners, this is the most important part of anything I talk about. Turns out that the dosage of the chemotherapy was broken down into multiple platinums, as it is. But the highest percentage was for Vincristin. Now, unbeknownst to me, but known to my Uncle Jay, Vincristin causes neuropathy in your fingers and toes. And that the dosage they were demanding it be at would have probably caused permanent neuropathy in my fingers and toes. Why is that a relevant conversation? Well, I'm a fucking pianist. And he came back to my dad and I, my mom had a breakdown um, and said, Matt, you don't want chemotherapy because they're they're unwilling to back off on what they think is best for you. But it's not best for you because if you're going to die in five years, hypothetically, you don't want to have nerve damage in your fingers and toes because the thing that matters most to you is playing again. You may not be able to go to grad school and be a film composer, but I know you, and you have one thing that you care about the most. You need to play piano. And if you do get the chemotherapy and you live 80 years, you'll never have piano in your life again. So let's give this perspective, like a moment of silence for the dogma here. Telling your 21-year-old godson at a 47-year-old age you would rather die in five years playing piano than live 80 without. And then here's how you tell these doctors that answer. So on May 20, the 30th, I think it was 22 already, went back to the doctors and said, we decided to decline your chemotherapy recommendation. Why? Where are the doctors? We know better than you. And I said, well, according to my godfather, the dosage will cripple my ability to ever play piano again. It's like, so <laughs> what? Yeah. They like did that, like, you know, in the, in the crime scene room where they stand up and slam their hands on the desk. How <laughs> dare you, sir? Yeah. Question our authority. We're trying to save your life. And it was at that moment, my dad and I looked at each other and was like, we're out, we're done. Um, so that was my last day as a patient at Sloan Kettering. Wasn't my last day dealing with shit. In yeah. the wake of it, it took me four and a half to five years, maybe more, to, I would say, get over all the acute symptoms. I, I, you know, don't look under the hood is my motto these days, 27 years later. But, you know, again, we made progress in terms of the fact that I had no 
psychosocial support. I had no peer support. I had no mental health support. I had no financial support. I had no career support. I had no sexual function support. I had nothing. And again, I have this perspective of like, we have to look at where the progress is before we yell at where the progress isn't. So that's like part one of my story. So that's, that's, you're 22 you years old and 22. you have this, you, it's a death sentence. It was a much shorter death sentence and then it was longer, but then at that point you still are probably aren't even believing anyone because you don't know what's true and what's not. Right. But you have this, your uncle kind of the savior comes in and he says, no, listen, I have your best interest at heart. I know what's going on here. The answer is no, you're not going to chemo. So then fast forward, it's, that's 27 years ago. So right. not, not to rush the story because I want to hear the rest of it, but tell us how this whole thing, you, one minute you're, you have, you know, basically five minutes to live and, and now it's 30 years later. Yeah. So the only other part of my story that matters into how I got into this crazy business was through an accidental introduction relationship. And it always is, it comes down to that like random, I didn't know you were there. Where were you when I needed you relationship? And it really came down to the fact that I did wind up playing piano again. It took me a long time. And I went out to LA to my friend's recording studio. He did go into film school, but as a sound designer. And I laid down some piano music. I finally got to expunge what was in my head. And I, I, I produced some CDs for myself for no, no commercial gain. And I gave those CDs out to doctors and patients like, Hey, look, I'm alive. I play. And here you go. And one day a roach rep came in and said, Oh, what, what's this? Said, oh, it's this kid's CD. He's alive. And <clears throat> can I have it? Sure. Take it back. And they found that the, the anti-emetic I was on was a Roche product. So they called me and said, we'd like you to become a spokesperson for this anti-emetic. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. So I got sucked into the uh, pre-Sunshine Act healthcare marketing wasted spend universe. Roche bought like 100,000 copies of my CD, slapped their drug on it, gave it away all over the world. And I got the attention of the American Cancer Society. And I started playing piano at their Relay for Life events. And they gave away my CDs. So Roche sponsored me at Relay for Life events. That was what got the attention of a gentleman named Craig Lusty. And this is where my, my multiverse splits. Why everything I do today is because of Craig Lusty. He found me on a Columbia listserv, brain tumor listserv at Columbia. That's how old we are. And he sent me an email over AOL, as one did back then, and said, I want to know you. I saw you perform. I love your story. Because I was written up everywhere as like the cancer tainer. That's what they called me back then. And I want to meet you at the Soho Hotel. Uh, come, I'm sorry. Craig, Craig tipped, uh, tick, ticked like eight boxes at once. You talk about peer-to-peer -peer support, which again is today's narrative. More, more better decisions are made with people that have been through it than doctors can recommend, which is, I'm glad the date is there to support that. Craig was um, Jewish from New York City. He was bald. He had a brain cancer in his 20s. Um, he was treated in pediatrics and not young adult. He went to Binghamton and he was in my acapella group. You're like my cousin, my yeah. brother. Yeah. He's still one of my best friends. Soul I talked to him a couple of days ago. Craig happened to work at the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, which is a very it's it's the oldest national healthcare policy group for cancer survivorship. They founded in 1986. No one knows they exist. They're extremely powerful. And Craig was on their board and worked for them. And he's like, how would you like to be a cancer advocate? My response, what the fuck is a cancer advocate? He's and like, how oh, old you'll you find out. Point? How old are you at this point? 25 maybe okay so you're still young um so my day job because i couldn't go to grad school was i went up like being a macintosh it fixing person at all the agencies in the city macs were really really terrible in the 1990s and i was one of the people that knew how to fix them for ad agencies so that right. was kind of how i stumbled into the advertising industry which i spent a decade in but craig created this alternate universe for me and brought me into the Beltway. And that got me to Livestrong, 
which was approaching its heyday. And then that brought me to like this wellspring of people upon whose shoulders I now stand that helped like form me into, I don't know, like, um, like Pygmalion, but I didn't kill them version of that. <laughs> like they shaped me. This is what the country needs. You're the only funny one here. Let's go do something for Gen Zers and I'm sorry for Gen Xers at the time. Yeah. <clears throat> and that paved the way for me to, I guess what I'm most known for is the, the origin of stupid cancer. Right. Which was a juggernaut cultural phenomenon in the wake of Livestrong's downfall. The phoenix of that was stupid cancer. So after stupid can so stupid cancer comes around and that was um now how old are you and how did you wind up getting into all of this other advocacy, being a spokesperson, all these other companies coming to you, starting the podcast? I understand there's a book in the works. So this stuff's just yeah. started to snowball. Now, do you still think you're dying or or are you like, no, I'm gonna live forever? I mean, I'm slowly disintegrating like anyone else, but I don't think I'm going to die of brain cancer. I, I, my my oncologist joke with me, you're going to die something else for sure. I don't know what it is, but it's probably not going to be the thing that's out of your head. All right, done. I'll take that. What brought me to today is just another moment that I couldn't have expected to happen. And this really is what set me apart from other advocates that were just getting started in the mid to late 2000s. And this comes back to media. So I have a mentor. She passed away named Selma Schimmel. She hosted the first terrestrial AM broadcast of cancer conferences. She and her nonprofit would schlep a whole bunch of shit, to these trade shows. And she would record the sessions, interview the speakers in these little dark rooms and distribute CDs to every attendee <coughs> so they could recap the conference and capture everything and whatever. Selma's nonprofit was approached by a digital platform for like live streaming audio. Again, we're, we're going back to the old days. And she's like, I don't want to do this. I'm too old for this. No, I'm too young for this. I'm too old. You're just young enough to be the radio show shock talk of healthcare. Why don't you take the show? Famous last words. So on May 28, 2007, I launched the Stupid Cancer Show and became the loudest voice in the country with a one-hour pre-programmed live show every every Monday for two years before it became a podcast and a live show. So over the course of 13 years, 500 episodes and almost 5 million streams, I got hyper-famous as the Howard Stern of a very niche market, and I'm extremely famous in a tiny shot class because I'm the cantertainer, the Howard Stern of healthcare, what are they, the people's voice in healthcare, the John Stewart meets, whatever. I love what the media is calling me because I feel like I am the voice of the country that it doesn't have. So I was involved in Health 2 con I was on the board of Google Health. I've advised lots of Silicon Valley startups on how to not fuck this up. I've helped a lot of digital health startups understand you're doing this for people that are not in the room. How about you think about that? I left stupid cancer four years ago to go become a public speaker. But, and to, to kind of take my show into another version of itself, which I did. And then the pandemic changed everything as it did for everyone. Right, right. Which necessitated a revenue model that I built with my co-founder called Offscript Health, which is a Prestige documentary podcast studio for patient engagement, something that doesn't exist in the world. And we use pharma marketing tactics to put ads for our series in front of patients and our engagement is fantastic. We can get 100,000 lung cancer patients to listen to one episode of my show. So Amazing. that is a secret sauce no one put together before. And the fact that I bring all my nonprofit relationships <clears throat> to the table, you know, we used to joke that my scandal is pending. <laughs> I yeah. think it's still pending at this point. So I have always been told, you know, write a book, write a book, write a book, write a book. And it was never the right time. And I didn't want to write like, I had cancer book because there were a lot of those and I have respect for those, but it was, it, the country doesn't need another I had cancer book. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I leaned into a couple of people and said, well, if I were to write a book, what the hell does the country need to read? Which is something that people don't stop and think about. I understand there's a lot of need to just tell your story and, and that's great, but there are there's a lack of prescriptive books at the layperson level in healthcare. Like just do this shit. You're you're in, you have a high school education. It's really easy, and make it funny. You know, no one wants this shit. That that's the whole point. Like no one asks to get in the healthcare car and drive it away because someone's going to pay for the fuel. You hope, or you're going to pay for the fuel, and they're in charge of where it goes. And that's right. not the way you're supposed to do transportation. There's my metaphor for the day. <clears throat> so I I spent a year in stealth mode with a New York Times bestselling writer who I was paired with through some Hollywood friends that I know through Stand for the Cancer, because I was also involved with Stand for the Cancer. And we came up with this grand idea of a comedy, a comedy book for the average American that's based on history, progress, American advocacy, American ingenuity, chr chronologic progress across the last 50 years. My story is more of a, I'm kind of like the, the narrator, then it's my story. Yeah. Because I feel like everything I've talked about on the show is very Forrest Gump. I didn't expect to be there. I didn't expect that person to be there. I didn't expect my universe to go in this direction. Kind of just follow the flow. And I work with the flow, unlike Forrest Gump, who just like went with the flow. Right. So the book was sold, the proposal was sold to Mayo Clinic Press. It was a big announcement. It's called Permission to be Pissed, a Practical Field Guide to American Healthcare. And it's coming out 2025. And in between now and then, I'm working on a whole new experience for myself as a production company of one that I'm scaling into, or going back to my 2019 plan, which is paid talks, talent agency, paid media, my show, more documentaries like the one I did with Off Script called Cancer Mavericks. And it's an exciting time for the country in the sense of, yeah, there's a lot of crap that's terrible, but we only perseverate on the shit that isn't working. And it's hard to remember how far we've come back when everybody just died. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and the, the thing that I love about your story, just to unpack some of this, is that you you've taken this approach of unapologetic, I'm going to be real, I'm going to stay true to myself, from the decision of, of not doing the chemo, to speak my voice, I'm going to, you, you had, it's funny, you, <laughs> when we talked, you said, yeah, I'm, I'm the armchair idiot. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's a funny way of saying, I'm the guy that's going to speak his mind. I'm the guy that, and, and, and I think that that's what we need in this country to, have more advocates, to have more people that are looking behind the curtain, more people that are getting out in front that are saying, yeah, no, nah, we know better than that. There's something more going on here. Um, well, the, 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 my reaction to that is that a lot of the people I know who've been in the mouse trap trenches or the hedge maze trenches for, we can only impact as many people as we can a year. Mm-hmm. I look at stupid cancer's massive progress is that they were at the time there were like 70,000 cancer diagnoses under 40, which is the market back then. It was like blood cancers and cervical and, and whatever. And between all of the nonprofits, there must've been like 15 or 20 of us. Maybe we all, maybe a thousand <clears throat> of those 70,000 knew we existed and took advantage of our services. Maybe. Where were the other 69,000 people? We couldn't scale to reach them, but they're there. Hmm. And today, the same narrative is there, except it's more complicated because Google screws everything up. So what better way to scale from I can only help a thousand people to I can help a million people yeah. than going mainstream mm -hmm. in the national conversation, but being a human being and not a stiff and and I love the idea of I, I love the idea that you're writing a book. That's great. But you have a podcast that's does so much more than just put words on a piece of paper. Because pot and I'm a, obviously I'm a big podcast fan, but it's timeless, it's endless, 
it's educational it's entertaining and it brings it brings a lot of different things to a lot of different people including knowledge and hope and so you've found the perfect platform for you and you know it's funny so guys just so you know when matt and i talked about what we were going to do for this podcast he's like no we're not going to have a topic he's like we're just going to talk and i think that that's the perfect way to have you present yourself because you're so good. I mean, I mean, we, we just, 40 minutes just blew by like that. I feel like we need to go another 40 minutes, but what message, what message do you have for the, the folks that listen to this podcast are typically um, pharmaceutical professionals that are in this healthcare environment. Um, and mm. there are many of them either advocates or, um, some are, are on the clinical side or have a background as a clinician, but they're in this maze um, navigating into on the pharmaceutical side on behalf of the manufacturer, but also with the goal of the patient in mind. So what advice or what words of wisdom do you have for those folks? I have many. I'm trying to think of which ones matter most to your question right now. I would say from an industry perspective, the hubris, which is no one's fault, really. It's kind of like just blame it on the, the way that the risk assessment of the system is inherently built right mm. now, is that compliance is the death of empathy. Mm. And these are, and I'm not, this is like, we're all patients. That's not what this conversation is. It's no one wants to be shopping in that store. You want to buy a fridge, you can research your fridge. You can pick your fridge, you pay for your fridge. Healthcare is not, an, and I don't mean like break, fix, primary care. Like that's that's normal. Mm -hmm. Like a cold, 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 flu, my kid has a rash, whatever. That's fine. <clears throat> no one asks to be sick. No one asks for a rare disease or some crazy condition or to get cancer. No one, no, no one wants that. So you're thrust into a store you didn't want to shop in, that someone mm -hmm. else is in charge of the products and services and pricing, and you have no to trust. And the way in which the store employees talk to you is you're an idiot. They treat you like an idiot. And they also blame you for not knowing things that they just expect you to snap and to know. Again, this, is, this isn't like in a sale at any one person. I don't throw anything under the bus except the American process of commercial stupidity. If you need human beings at the end of this pill to know what the hell they're doing, then you can talk to them like people the way consumers do, except you can't. And what are the workarounds to really think about the way in which healthcare talks person? Mm -hmm. Because nothing, and I use a broad brush, nothing works. When I see commercials for A1C, A1C medications targeting the black community that take place at a barbecue, who decided that that was a good tone to bring that message to the black community, lower your A1C to barbecue. That is not a good way to think about it. So I, long answer to a short question. <laughs> Pharma marketing strategy is a waste of money and a waste of time when you're doing consumer. And mm -hmm. that's the role I really want to bring to the conversation when I do contracting work and speak to these industries. It's medical marketing is really important and empathy to medical doctors is really important. But if the patient isn't the end user because they don't pay for it, how do you talk to the patient who needs that empathy? Hmm. It's a conundrum that I think I have some thoughts on. And when I have thoughts, it's dangerous. <laughs> but my message is that everything has to work the way it does. But no one is really looking at the auditing of whether it matters. Yeah, that's true. That's deep. You guys still with me? That's deep. <laughs> um, well, listen, I, we can go forever. Um, this was great. I, I mean, I appreciate you coming on. Before we before we end, though, just tell everybody about how they can find your podcast or find you. Um, I just I think that you have a, such a great story to tell, and I just I love the way you tell it, and I love the. Um, it's just a breath of fresh air in a time when everything is so serious and everything is so calculated. So um, just 
you know, I, and I don't normally promote or plug anything, but I, but I, I, I do appreciate everything you're doing. Um, so give a shout out to yourself. Yeah. I'm not selling anything. I just, that's why I love to you. help people feel like it's you're okay to you. laugh at this crap. And, <laughs> exactly. uh, yeah. Um, I, I'll just, uh, so Matthew Zachary, very Googleable, very mm-hmm. Google. You can find me anywhere. I'm the only Matthew Zachary pretty much in podcasting and on the internet. That's very fortunate to be from an SEO perspective. I'm not, I'm in the SEO for my name. The way in which people can envision my conversations on my show are I take the serious into semi-serious. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> my show is called Out of Patience for a reason. And I'll wrap by giving you one quick anecdote of what you can expect if you listen to the show. I recently did an episode with a gentleman named John Nelson who was living with um, treatment-resistant major depressive disorder. The man wanted to kill himself every day. Mm. Couldn't control it. He literally wanted to kill himself. And his kids and his wife would make sure he didn't kill himself every day. Horrible story. And he met a doctor with an FDA-approved treatment in deep brain stimulation, which, again, people maybe nodded their heads while listening to the story. And she basically put, like, magnets in his brain and controls them with, like, an Atari joystick, and it turned off his suicide. It's like a binary light switch that just turned off his suicide. And he's living a great life now with these magnets in his head and the Atari 2600 joystick. But I ended the show the way I said, well, now that you don't want to kill yourself, how do you deal with the fact that you're really ugly? End of the show. <laughs> and he's not ugly. But this is the way we have to start thinking about the need of yeah. being in this space because you can't always be that serious. I love it. Well, you're a breath of fresh air, my friend. Thank you for coming on. Um, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Check out Matthew Zachary, and uh, we're going to have to do this again soon. But definitely breath of fresh air. Very different from what we normally do. But guys, you know, when I met Matt, I was like, man, I need to mix it up. You're the perfect guy. Hey, you know what? I wish you all the best and everything that you're doing. I can't wait to read your book. 2025. 2025. Yes. Awesome. Well, be well, my friend. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Tom, very much. All right. Thanks for joining us, guys. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the show. And if you enjoyed it, please subscribe so that you don't miss an episode in the future. And feel free to leave a rating or a review or a comment. Thanks again. And we look forward to seeing you soon.